Hello everyone and welcome to this new video. Today we're talking about OpenSUSE Leap 16, a release that, I'll tell you right away, represents an epochal turning point for this distribution. If you know OpenSUSE, you know it's always been that somewhat undervalued distro. It doesn't make much noise, doesn't have Ubuntu's marketing or Arch's popularity, but when you use it you realize it's solid as a rock. Well, with Leap 16 all this changes, at least in part. We're entering a profound transition phase that touches practically every aspect of the distribution. The most important news is that it's now based on SUSE Linux Framework 1 SLF STO, which is the evolution of the Adaptable Linux Platform, or ALP, project. This new framework represents SUSE's future and replaces the traditional SLE base. Then we have Wayland becoming the default, CLinux replacing AppArmor, and prepare for the plot twist, Yast is no longer the core experience you find when you install the system. The result is a distribution that feels much more enterprise-minded, less of that single panel for everything thing that characterized OpenSUSE, and more oriented towards modern and specific components. And there's another interesting thing. The Leap ecosystem now also includes the immutable variant Leap Micro 6.2, which you can select directly from the installation media if you prefer a more modern approach like Silverblue. Leap 16 Classic remains traditional and modifiable though. Obviously, all this brings lights and shadows, and in the next half hour, we'll analyze them together calmly. So, let's start right away with the elephant in the room, Yast. For those who don't know, YAST has always been the administration tool of OpenSUSE, a sort of centralized control panel where you could manage practically everything, packages, users, services, network, firewall. It was the very identity of this distribution. Well, if you do a clean installation of Leap 16, the YAST modules aren't there, period. In their place, you'll find Merlin for package management, which is more modern and user-friendly, and Cockpit for system administration, which is the standard used by Red Hat and other enterprise distributions. Now, attention, some pieces of YAST still remain in the system as dependencies of Agama, the new installer, so it's not like it disappears completely. But the direction is very clear. In the long term, we're moving towards Cockpit as the standard solution. I have to be honest with you. This change is felt, and quite a lot. Those coming from previous versions of OpenSUSE might be a bit disoriented at first. It's as if they've changed the DNA of the distribution. But let's move on and see if this change makes sense in the general context. Let's move on to Zipper, which remains the command line package manager, and which in this version has received a couple of really interesting improvements. The first news is experimental parallel downloads, which are already present in the release candidates and should be enabled by default in the final version. Basically, when you do an update or install packages, Zipper can now download multiple files simultaneously instead of going one at a time. If you have a fast connection, you can really feel the difference, especially when there are big updates or you need to install many packages together. The second news concerns the repository architecture. They've implemented what they call Repository Index Service, or RES, managed by the OpenSUSE repos package. In simple words, repository metadata is smaller and refresh is faster. Additionally, the old separate update repositories have disappeared. Now everything is more integrated and streamlined. These might seem like boring technical improvements, but I assure you that in daily use they make a difference. Zipper was already fast and reliable, now it's become even more efficient. A question you often ask me is, but how many packages are there in OpenSUSE? Can I find everything I need? With Leap 16, the structure has been simplified quite a bit. We have a main repository called Repo OS that integrates both community packages and those coming from SLE. Then there's the classic Repo Non OS for proprietary packages, and obviously Pacman remains always recommended for multimedia and codecs. The exact numbers fluctuate a bit during release candidates, that's normal, but the coverage remains very broad. And when you really can't find something in the official repositories, there's always OBS, the open build service, 
and the software.opensuse.org site that cover practically any need. The practical point is this. Always verify that you have RepoOS, RepoNonOS, and Pacman enabled, and use Merlin or Zipper to search for alternatives in the community build projects. You'll hardly run out of options. From the kernel perspective, Leap 16 inherits from SLE 16, the kernel 6.12 Tor with all the enterprise patching. It's a conservative choice if you compare it with Tumbleweed and other mainstream Linux distributions, which obviously always have the latest available kernel. But it's perfectly consistent with the stability goal that Leap sets for itself. Kernel 6.12 is still modern and supports recent hardware well, so for most users, it shouldn't be a problem. If instead you have very new hardware or absolutely need the latest support, well, for that, there's always Tumbleweed. Let's come to the installation, which is perhaps the most visible aspect of this philosophy change. The new installer is called Agama and is completely web-based. It replaces the historic OpenSUSE installation interface that many of you knew. Agama is certainly more modern and convenient for contemporary layouts and lends itself better to automation. However, I have to tell you the truth, it's still a bit immature in some paths. During the release candidates, there were several quick fixes. Problems with beta ISOs, Wi-Fi configurations after installation, some bugs with legacy boot on particular configurations. The maturation curve shows, you know, if you're coming from the classic YAST installer, the paradigm change can result in being less direct and intuitive. It's not that it's difficult to use, it's just different as an approach. Personally, I think that over time it will definitely get better, but at the moment it's one of those cases where you feel it's version 1.0 of something. Let's come to the first impressions once the system is installed. The first thing you notice is Wayland by default. X11XORG is no longer the first choice, although it remains available for compatibility with legacy applications that still don't support Wayland well. The stack is all updated, GNOME 48.0, with the goal of reaching 48.1 in the final version, KDE Plasma 6.3.4 pointing towards 6.4, and a more clean, general setup compared to the past. They've also cleaned house of many legacy technologies. For example, the old SysV and init D scripts are gone. Everything has been modernized towards systemed. The initial feeling is one of coherence and sobriety. There are no longer those monolithic wizards that characterized OpenSUSE, but more targeted and specific tools. It's a leap more professional than flashy if you'll allow me the expression. Those coming from Windows or Mac OS will probably find it less disorienting compared to previous versions, precisely because it's less full of proprietary tools and more similar to other modern Linux distributions. Those who are attached to the OpenSUSE way of doing things, well, they'll have to get used to it. Let's talk about something practical that interests many, NVIDIA drivers. The recommended path remains using the official NVIDIA repository via Zipper. You need to install the OpenSUSE repos NVIDIA meta package, or the specific OpenSUSE repos leap NVIDIA variant if available, or manually add the NVIDIA repository for your version, then install the appropriate G06 driver packages for your GPU. You can choose between open source or proprietary drivers, depending on what your card supports. The only thing to pay attention to is secure boot and MOK key management if you have secure boot enabled. Without Yasti pre-installed, it's less click-click done. You have to use the command line a bit more, but the documentation is very clear and the process is still quite straightforward. It's not more complicated than other distributions, it's just different from how it was before. Here we come to a sore point, especially for those who also use Linux for gaming. The problem is that in the default configuration, support for 32-bit applications is not active. This creates some headaches for Steam and Wine because many games, especially older ones, require 32-bit libraries to work. Now, it's not that support is completely blocked. 
There are kernel parameters and configurations that allow you to reactivate it, but you have to do it manually. First of all, enable IA32 emulation by installing GRUB2 Compat IA32, which passes the IA32 emulation equals 1 parameter to the kernel. Then, for Silinux policies, you also need to install the Silinux policy targeted gaming package. Additionally, Steam has been removed from the non-OSS repository precisely because of these limitations with 32-bit libraries. The most practical solution is often to use the Steam Flatpak, which manages dependencies more autonomously and bypasses some limitations of the base system. The point is this. You can absolutely game on Leap 16, but it requires a minimum of manual configuration. If you want zero friction and install Steam with one click, Probably Tumbleweed or other desktop-oriented distributions are more immediate. Leap 16 requires you to put your hands a bit more in the engine, but once configured it works well. From a security perspective, the biggest news is that Silinux becomes the default on new installations. AppArmor remains available as an option, but is no longer the default choice. This alignment with SLE brings a more rigorous hardening profile and more granular security policies. For the desktop user, this translates into some additional prompts or rules to manage. We've seen the gaming example, but in return, you have a much more robust base for servers and workstations. Linux has a reputation for being complicated, and it's partly true that it has a steeper learning curve than AppArmor. But it's also true that it's the de facto standard for enterprise environments and offers much finer control over permissions and processes. If you work in areas where security is critical, this change is definitely added value. Leap 16 relies completely on the new SUS Linux Framework 1, and this brings concrete advantages in terms of compatibility, maintenance cycles, and software predictability. But there's another important news. Community support officially extends to 24 months per release, with overlap between versions to allow more relaxed upgrades. An aspect that's often not mentioned is that Leap 16 supports different architectures. Besides the classic x86-64, we have ARCH64 for ARM64, PPC64LE for power processors, and S390X for IBM mainframes. This makes it interesting not only for traditional desktops and servers, but also for more specialized environments. This is great for offices, public administration, laboratories, and all those environments where you don't want the latest graphical novelty, but stability and predictability. You can plan upgrades calmly without the anxiety of remaining on unsupported versions. It's clear that OpenSUSE is increasingly focusing on this segment, perhaps also to better differentiate itself from Tumbleweed, which remains the option for those who want the most recent available software. Let's make a point about known issues and minor matters. Wayland is at the center of the experience. Zorg remains for compatibility, but is no longer the first choice. On the installer side, many bugs have been resolved in the path from beta to release candidate, but legacy installations and hybrid configurations still have some sporadic reports. The new repository management VRIS and OpenSUSE repos works well, but has eliminated the separate update repositories. Now everything is more integrated. Finally, there's the x86-64-v2 requirement, which means very old hardware remains excluded. An important thing, if you're coming from Leap 15.6, the upgrade is officially supported via Zyper Dupe Release 16.0. However, I recommend disabling all third-party repositories before doing the upgrade. There's also an experimental migration tool called OpenSUSE Migration Tool that can simplify the process, although it's still in testing phase. For those doing the upgrade, keep in mind that you'll then need to reconfigure some things especially if you used YAST a lot or had particular configurations for gaming. Nothing dramatic, but these are things to keep in mind if you have particular configurations or dated hardware. So, who is this distribution suitable for? I'd say it's perfect for users who want a stable, predictable, and clean distribution. 
It's great for administrators who appreciate cockpit and a well-curated package collection. It's ideal for developers and creators who prefer to use Flatpak for the most recent desktop applications on top of a solid and tested base. It's less suitable for those looking for the latest graphical novelty without having to tinker with configurations, or for those who want a game without worries. For these cases, there are other options in the Linux landscape. The overall behavior is linear with few rough edges. There are still some typical release candidate bugs and the experience is less button customized than in the past, but both GNOME and KDE Plasma offer satisfying and stable sessions. The general profile is very no-nonsense. You work more than play with control panels. This is a precise choice, less immediate customization, more focus on stability and productivity. Let's take a step back and talk about the OpenSUSE project as a whole. It's a large and mature community with a solid foundation behind it, really excellent documentation, one of the best in the Linux world, and very active forums. The courage to cut old habits like Yast everywhere to push on Agama, Cockpit, and Silinux tells of a living project oriented towards the future, even if this means displeasing some historic users. It's a courageous bet and I think in the long term it will prove to be winning. Leap 16 is really a re-foundation release. It's less identity driven on the YAST front, more modern and aligned with enterprise standards. If you're looking for stability combined with contemporary tools, it's definitely approved. If you want plug and play gaming or the latest graphical stack, maybe it's better to evaluate alternatives or plan for some extra configuration. Let's also talk about the critical aspects because it's right to be honest. Agama is still in the maturation phase. The user experience and some special paths need to be polished. The transition to C-Linux is powerful, but creates initial friction for the average desktop user. And the absence of out-of-the-box 32-bit support is a real setback for a good part of the gaming catalog. These aren't fatal flaws, but they are aspects you need to consider if you're evaluating this distribution. Ultimately, Leap 16 is not your old open SUS. It's a bridge to the next decade, where the enterprise base sets the pace and tools change face. It has less immediate wow factor, but more long-term substance. If you share this philosophy, it will reward you with reliability and a 24-month support cycle that's music to the ears of those who need to work seriously. If you're looking for something else, well, fortunately in the Linux world, alternatives are never lacking.